We're going to look at verses 13 through 16. And if you remember from weeks past, the Apostle Paul and what he and Silas and his team were doing as they traveled out from Jerusalem into the rest of the world. They were going to present the gospel in places that had not heard. And so they were planting churches in various places. He said that he and his team worked night and day. And because of God's goodness to them and through them, the faith community grew and their love for one another grew as well. Planting a church is no easy task, believe me. It requires great courage, requires commitment, and it requires sacrifice. All of us have benefited from those who have gone before for us. In some ways, we owe them a great debt for giving of themselves to communicate the gospel to us and establish a church. Even a church that we now belong. And it would be, and we will share more stories. It would be good for those who are joining from the other congregation to know more about the story of Temple. To know even about this pulpit, which I was told this morning by Paul, who made it and what was done. It was good for those of Temple and Myanmar Christian Fellowship to hear the stories of how those churches started and what God did through them. And we will hear in greater details those stories. But I want to bring us back to the starting. Because every church has a start. Somebody had to respond to God's calling. Somebody had to go. Somebody had to gather. Somebody had to sacrifice. And we are benefactors of their sacrifice. In 1880, 140 years ago, a small group of courageous, committed, and sacrificial Swedish immigrants banded together with their pastor, Eric Wingren, to start a new church called the Scandinavian Baptist Church of Rockford, which then became the first Swedish Baptist Church of Rockford, which then became Temple Baptist Church of Rockford, which then became Cross Point Church of Rockford. That was funny, whoever did that. Okay. We why don't you let this soak in? We are benefactors and results of their courage, of their commitment, of their sacrifice. In 2007, a small group of courageous, committed, and half crazed people <laughs> banded together with their pastor. David Spooner, to start a new church called Mosaic Rockford, which combined with, early on, Gateway Community Church, which has now become Cross Point Church of Rockford. We are benefactors and fruit of their courage, their commitment, and their sacrifice. In 2012, a small group of courageous, committed, and sacrificial Myanmar immigrants banded together with their pastor, Ki Thang, to start a new church called Myanmar Christian Fellowship, which has now become Cross Point Church of Rockford, Myanmar. We are the benefactors and fruit of their courage, their commitment, and sacrifice. All of these churches have gone through difficult 
times. All of them at times did not know if they were going to make it. And at times, I know at least in my life, I didn't know if I was going to make it. <laughs> there are times in which those who start a church, they sacrifice greatly. I remember working, just volunteering for the church as everyone volunteered for the church because we had very, very little money. Working one, two, three jobs in addition to trying to lead a church. Churches go through church splits. And we early on had a third of the people leave. And Temple can sell their story. And me and our Christian fellowship can tell their story. There were heartbreaks. There were cruel accusations. There were wonderings, God. And I reminded God often that it was his idea to start the church. But through it all, God does his work. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And believe me, the gates of hell war against it. Why? Because the church, the bride of Christ, is the most beautiful, wondrous, and magnificent creature of all creation. And she is worth it. And you are worth it. Every time a church is planted, where faith is grown and love is shown, we ought to thank God and greatly rejoice. Amen right there, right? Every time this happens, and Faith endures and love continues. We ought to thank God. And Paul starts his letter to the Thessalonians thanking God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, he says, I thank God for you. And again, he thanks God for them later on in the letter. 1 Thessalonians 3, 9. And he thanks God twice for them in his second letter. Letter, And we'll see this as we continue looking at these letters in verse 1, um, chapter 1, verse 3, verse 2, chapter 13. And again in our text today, we see Paul thanking God for them. And in this text this morning, there are three reasons of thanksgiving that we want to look for in our own congregation. We have reason to thank God that we have faith and that there's love in this place and God's word is going forward. And those who sacrificed to bring this message to us, we ought to thank God. So first thing from our text we need to thank God for, we thank God for the reception of his word. We can thank God that his word has been received. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I'm using the New Living Translation today. And so whatever version you have, you can just follow along. This is how Paul continues this letter. He says, Therefore, we never stop thanking God. Did you catch that? When, that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God. Which, of course, it is. Now the truth is, not everyone believes that the Bible and the gospel is the word of God. 
If you went around Rockford and various places, as you would tell them about this book, they may think it's just a book put together by humans and just human words. Not everyone understands that this book indeed is the word of God. And if you think this book is just human words, then people dissect it. They discredit it. They dismiss it. And many have. However, if you believe the gospel and the Bible are indeed the very words of God, then you receive it. And you embrace it. And you live by it. Whenever and wherever the Bible's message is received as the word of God and not mere human ideas, we have reason to thank God. <laughs> because there's no natural reason for people to do this. Right? Christ crucified, and this is scripture, Christ crucified is a stumbling block. To the Jews. And it's foolishness to the non-Jews, the Gentiles. But to those God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is both the power of God, the wisdom of God. And they recognize that His, this word, is the word of God. When people receive this, that God gives them ears to hear we should thank God for this. John 1, chapter 12 says, But to all, excuse me, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God works to transform hearts and mind. God works to establish his church. He is the one who is ultimately working in us and through us. We must thank God when his word is received for what it is. It's a supernatural work which is not just dependent upon the communication, okay? That's good news, right? If you feel like you stumble in communicating God's word, know that he is working through it, and know it's not dependent upon the communication alone, but the illumination that brings transformation that results in eternal salvation, right? We communicate, but we pray, God, will you? Illuminate this word in the hearts of those who hear. And in so doing, God, work your will of transformation that will result in eternal salvation. We ought to thank God for this. And ask him to give ears that hear and eyes that see so that people will turn from their sins and be Forgiven. When's the last time that you prayed for your neighbors this way? Your family this way? Our politicians this way? God, give them ears to hear. Not that just when they, when they hear the message that they recognize what it is. It's not mere human words. It is indeed the word of God. And when people open, when God opens their ears, and when eyes are opened to receive the world, word as it is, as the very word of God, we ought to thank God. And God continues to do this work among us. And we pray that this work continues among us. God, we thank you for this work that worked in our hearts. And God, we ask and we pray for our neighbors. We pray for 
our, excuse me, <coughs> for our nation. We pray for our community that they would receive your word for what it is. <clears throat> Thank God for the reception of his word. And I'm going to walk down here and grab this here so you don't have to listen to my frog voice. <clears throat> Second, Thank God for the working of his word. The working of his word. Now notice who we're thanking in all this. Right? Ultimately, God gets the credit when God transforms hearts and minds. Let's continue to read. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, starting with the third part of verse 13. And this word continues to work in you who believe. And then, your brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. So not only do we thank God when people receive His word, but we also need to thank God for the continued working of His word. This word only continues to work in those who believe. But once you believe it, once you receive it, the word will continue to work in you. And this working of the word is um, like a battery. And we're all familiar with batteries, right? I have a battery and I have one of my favorite toys. Okay. Now I want you to think about God's word like this. It works. It's powerful and effective. Right? It motivates. It illuminates. It transforms. But in order for this word to be received and to be effective, it has to be received into the heart and into the minds of those that the word is given. And once the word is in the heart of people, it works. And it continues to work. And continues to work. And continues to work until we are safely home. This will probably be the only thing we remember from today. <laughs> and that's okay, exactly. <laughs> Lee's here right here in the, in the front. And by the way, happy birthday, Lee. Today is his birthday. He's not nine, but it's a significant birthday today, and you can ask him. <laughs> you, you get the illustration? <laughs> the word it comes in to us, receive, but it works in us. right? Moving us forward, sustaining us in life. Encouraging and building and transforming. And so it has to be received. Right? But once it's received, mm, now it does its work. Right? Now it works to transform us. Now it works to encourage us. Now it works to energize us. It is living words. It is living and it is active and it transforms how we think. And scripture says, so when we do this, then we're able to test and approve his good, perfect, and pleasing will. We should thank God when people receive the word, but we thank God that the word continues to work. And may this word continue to work in us. And then once we know the word and the word knows us, we transforms us. And then we start to um, think differently. And then we know God's will. And then we follow God's word in doing his will. And in so doing, people come against Word, its work, and the people of God. Why? Knowing God's will and following God's word can get you in serious 
trouble from those who oppose God's will. When you say that through Jesus is the only way to be saved, according to the word, it will get you in trouble from those who think that it is a way, not the way. Those who think that Allah is the one true God. Or that some spiritisms or some other gods. When we say, according to God's word, that Jesus is the way, it will get you in trouble. When you say that God defines marriage as one man and one woman, it will get you in trouble with our countrymen. When you say that there's a thing as sin, or truth, or righteousness, or wrath, it will get you in trouble with those who think contrary to the word. And you will suffer persecution from your own country men. One of the promises that Jesus gave us is that you will be persecuted for righteousness sake. Isn't that a promise that you written on your window and on your mirror, right, to remember? Right? I claim that promise in Jesus' name, right? Doesn't get a whole lot of airtime. But he says it. Why? Because the word's been received. The word is working. And the devil and the world oppose God. And so we see in this church that the word continues to work. And, God, and Paul is thanking God for this. This church planter who suffered to bring them the word. He thanked God that they received it as it was. And he thanked God that this word continues to work. And then there's a recognition that there's suffering because of the word of God working from their own countrymen. And there is suffering then and there will be suffering now. And if faith and hope and love continue to thrive and grow and expand in the midst of persecution, we should thank God. Amen. And we must ask God to remove the stony places in our hearts. The places in which God's word hasn't penetrated the soil of your soul. This is a good prayer, not just for the community, but it is a prayer for us as well. As he is the potter, we are the clay. And as he works in us, sometimes we resist God. We read his word and like, well, I don't know about that. We need to ask God to remove the stony places in our hearts and the thickets in our thinking. So that we will continue to have the word and the will of God working and thriving in the soil of our souls. So God, we thank you for the continued working of your word. And we ask that your word would be firmly planted and exhibited in every facet of our thinking and our So we thank God for the reception of his word, and we pray that his word would be received for what it is. We thank God that his word continues to work in the midst of difficulty and persecution. Thirdly, we thank God for the finality of his word, and we're going to look at this theme some more in depth as Paul unpacks it for us. Thank God for the finality of his word. He continues in verse 14. In this way, you 
imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea who, because of their belief in Jesus Christ, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. Now they have persecuted us too. Suffering and persecution have always come against your family tree of faith. Always. We are a part. We've been grafted in to the family of faith. And there's always been suffering and persecution. It runs in the family from the very beginning. And when we persist in the word of God and follow the will of God... At times we will suffer and feel pressure and pushed against as well. And even in this, we can greatly rejoice that we are counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of his name. The apostles did this and those suffering have done this as well. When you suffer for the faith, you are identifying with those In the faith. And you are walking in the way of the faithful one. And you're suffering with him and as him, so to speak. There has been and will be those who oppose the word of God and persecute the people of God. Don't be surprised by this. Don't be foolish, but also always keep faith and be faithful. There has been persecution in our family tree, and it goes on even from the very beginning. And then he talks about these people who are coming against the church, who are coming against the working of the word, who are coming against the gospel. He says, they fail to please God. They fail to please God. And we saw that theme from last week. The goal is to please God. He says, they fail to please God. They work against all humanity. As they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. Now by doing this, they continue to pile up their sins. But the anger of God has caught up with them at (laughs) last. (laughs) That's the end. You never know what's going to happen any given Sunday. So the people who are coming against the gospel, the church, the people of God, fail to please God. And what's ironic about this, right? They fail to please God and work against all humanity. People, at least in our time and thinking, think that they're bringing peace to humanity by trying to get Christianity to get rid of their distinctives. Okay? When I say distinctives, the... the um, The points being that salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. That's number one, by the way. I want you to remember that the Antichrist is Antichrist. Not even Antichristian. How do you like that? Now, which is a misnomer because being a Christian means you're in Christ. So people in our world will say, yeah, yeah, you can be a Christian, but don't impose your religion on other people. Have you heard this before? Keep your, keep your views to yourself. And they think, well, in order for there to be peace in our world, for the betterment of humanity, keep your opinion inside your four walls. This is what he's saying. Those who oppose the message of the gospel are working against all humanity. Because they try to keep us from preaching the good news. Which, of course, in the end, is the best thing for humanity. Right? 
The saddest thing about persecution is not what it does to those being persecuted. The saddest thing is because those who need to hear don't. If you're persecuted, the end result is that you're still going to heaven. But if you stop proclaiming the message and people don't hear, it's going to be far worse for them. So when we pray for those who are proclaiming the word of God, we pray for those individuals, we pray for the Delameters, we pray for them. But more importantly, pray for who they're reaching. So often we get fixated on our own comforts versus being focused on the call of God. How often our prayers are so blooming selfish. Now you're messing, Pastor. If I did a survey of my own prayers, or perhaps your own prayers, how often are we praying primarily and perhaps solely about us? Versus praying, God, your will be done. God, your kingdom come. So people who oppose the gospel, right, oppose the words, they continue to pile up their sins. And God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. But there comes a point where God says, enough is enough. And do not mistake God's patience for God's approval. God allows persecutors, blasphemers, and opposers, He allows them to continue. And he does it and allows it because he's patient. But there comes a point where enough is enough. There comes a point where we all must give an account to the one who sits on the throne. The anger of God is caught up, caught up with them. last. God gives space for all of our words. He lets people do it. But he will always have the final word. That should give you pause. That should give you courage. Thank God when the word is received. Thank God when the word continues to work. And thank God that his word is final. No one's going to convince God different than what he's already stated. Just amen to that. And there comes a time in which we all must give an account. And Paul knew this. And our predecessors knew this. And those who planted churches know this. And I want you to know this as well. That God's word in the end will stand. Regardless of your opinion. Regardless of your education. Regardless of your disposition. God's word is final. And we should thank God for that. Thank God for the proclamation and reception of his word. Thank God for those who have brought it to us. Thank God that he's built his church. Thank God that we have a legacy of the family of faith. Thank God that we can trust his word. And that his word is indeed final. 
So I want us, those who are in this building, those who are in the uh, video feed, that when we come away from this morning, I want you to thank God for these things. Paul thanked God for it continually. And then I want us to focus in on this, focus our prayers on this, focus our heart on this, focus our, uh, focus our gaze on this. So God, here we are. As benefactors of your word, penetrating hearts and minds and people persisting in the faith. We're here as benefactors of those who have sacrificed and suffered and communicated the word. God, we are here as benefactors of your call of being included into this great family. And now we carry this word in our heart. And God, I ask for myself and for each and every one of us that we would continue to receive your word. I pray for those God, who continue to resist you, that there would be an opening of the eyes of the heart, opening of the ears of the heart that they could see and understand and hear and know and receive your word and find forgiveness through your son. God, I ask that we would choose to be thankful people to you. That there is faith in this building, in this community, and that there is love. And God, we ask that faith would continue to grow. We ask that love would continue to grow. God, we ask that those can be added to this so that your name would be praised and the nations will be glad. We thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness as the living word of God. And your continuance to live that among us. How the perfect lamb, this word, was sacrificed. And that in him we may be saved. We remember you this morning through communion. In Jesus' name, amen.